good morning. Good to see you. And again, my name is Josh, one of the pastors here, and uh, just glad to be with you today. Welcome to all of you joining us online. Really glad you're with us. And uh, today we begin a new series called Bookends. And I've got a pair up here on the table. Do you know how bookends work? Um, usually they're pretty heavy like these are. They're pretty beefy. And if you dropped it on your foot, it would hurt. You'd remember it. And you wouldn't want to do that. Um, but you can use them to hold up all kinds of stuff, you know, on your desk or papers or whatever else. But obviously they're meant to hold up. Do you know what one of these is? Maybe I should ask that a book. You know, and uh, you take the book and you, you put it in between the bookends and put it together so it doesn't tip over. And it just kind of forms and you can stack up however many you like there. But you know, God's word has some bookends like this that are the same, that that function is kind of holding all of his story together. And uh, we see them in Genesis one through three and also in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And these bookends make up kind of the beginning and the end of God's story. But sometimes what we fail to recognize is how similar those two bookends are. How what we see in, uh, in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 uh, is made complete and parallels Revelation 21 and 22. And these two bookends go together and just form a beautiful story and a complete image of God's sovereign power and care over all things. And that's how his word is set up. So before we look at that this morning, let's pray and then we're gonna dive in here the next few weeks just looking at these bookends and kind of comparing them and seeing how God is at work. So let me pray. Father, thanks for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are uh, in full control that you were there as we'll see at the beginning and that uh, as Paul writes, you, you hold and sustain all things by the word of your power. And uh, as John writes, that you'll be there in control, reigning and ruling in the end as well. Uh, Jesus, thank you too that you didn't leave us to ourselves when we messed things up, but that uh, you're superintending all of history to orchestrate uh, your original plans and to bring them to uh, fulfillment in the end uh, for your glory, for our good, and for our joy. So Holy Spirit, uh, teach me, teach through me today. Uh, let us see the, the, uh, the, the power of who you are in your word, your, your creative power, your, your sovereign power, but also your deep care and concern about us, even while wielding such power. Father, thanks for Jesus. We pray all this through him. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to look at the bookends, Genesis and Revelation. And one curious thing about both Genesis and Revelation is that people seem to be a little bit obsessed with the timing of both. There, there's a lot of talk, you know, about the, the timing of Genesis. How old is the earth? How long has everything been around? Did God really create everything in six literal days? Or was it like six day ages and long periods of time? And, and then what about Revelation? When are all these things gonna happen? And, and who, who are these people that it's speaking of? And can I figure it out? Can I predict what's gonna happen next? And one of the things at the outset when we talk about Genesis and Revelation, we need to point out that the focus of both of them are not about the when, they're about the who. It's not the when did it happen or when will it happen, it's who made it happen and who will be in control when it happens. Genesis and Revelation are more, much more about the who. I would even argue maybe entirely about the who and not the when. Um, you might even just jot that statement down both in the beginning of Revelation, or excuse me, the beginning of Genesis in your Bible, and then at the end, on the last page, by uh, the end of Revelation, just that th these things are not about the when, they're about the who. Uh, you know, before we dive in, it's probably worthwhile just to talk a little more about things that uh, Genesis in particular, because that's where we'll be today, that Genesis is not the book of Genesis. See, uh, one of the things uh, the book of Genesis is not is it was never intended 
Uh, Genesis, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, is just the first book of the Bible. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. And, and Genesis, the first one, is not a science book. It was never intended to give a scientific account of creation uh, and all the scientific details and how it all came about. And No, it was just intended to tell us who was there in control of everything at creation. And and why would that be? Well, so that when we face our own trials and struggles and uh, things in life that seem overwhelming and and totally powerful over us, we would remember, no, we've got a God who was there in the beginning, before it all began, who spoke everything into existence. And since he's so big, we can trust him with whatever circumstances are going on in our life. In, In fact, the other thing to recognize is that Genesis was never intended to be a book of world history. It's not intended to give a complete history of how everything went down and explain exactly how old the earth is. Genesis is is a history for sure, but do you know what kind of history it is? It's actually a family history. It's a family history. See, Genesis was written by the prophet Moses. Uh, And not just Genesis, but even the first five books of the Old Testament, maybe you've heard of uh, something called the Torah before. That that consists of the first five books in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they were all written by Moses, uh, in essence, really, in a lot of ways, as, as one unit. And so Genesis is just the first part of that. And Moses, if you remember, uh, and if you don't, I'll I'll try to help you understand who he was. Uh, Moses was chosen by God to to rescue his people out of slavery in Egypt. God's people in Egypt had been uh, put into slavery under Pharaoh, and uh, they they were in Egypt for over 400 years, and then finally when uh, the persecution and opposition against them became so great, they called out to God for help, and he raised up this guy named Moses at age 80 to rescue them. And Moses does exactly that. Well, then uh, what Moses does is he leads them across the Red Sea and they go to Mount Sinai and get the law and he's taking them by God's grace uh, to the land that had been promised to their ancestor, Abraham. But Moses, when he starts writing these things down then, he's got to remind some of these people uh, who they are. After he hears from God at Mount Sinai and he begins writing down the law and different things, it's a family history so that they know who they are because they're heading into a land that has been occupied by foreign people and there's all kinds of foreign gods and and people worshiping, uh, some just totally false gods, some that have some demonic power behind them. And uh, they need to know when they face opposition who the true God is, who their God is, And that before any of this, he was. And he's been in control the whole time. See, that's why Moses says, in the beginning, in the beginning what? Or I should say, who? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not all these other gods, not everything else. Uh, No, God created everything. And so that they would remember that. And you know, it's the same for us. As, as we head into life and we face all kinds of different trials and uh, different opposition and different things that seem so huge looming over us, we can remember and be reminded by Moses here that in the beginning, God. And he's supreme in power and authority over all of it. You know, we talked about Genesis a little bit and uh, the other thing additionally is Genesis doesn't really speak to how old the earth is. That's one question when we start talking about creation, people want to know, how old is the earth? How old is creation? Personally, I, I tend to uh, think our, the creation in our earth is a young earth, six, 7,000 years old. Would I die for that? No. Um, and, and so sometimes though, people, if maybe you share that conviction and, and you hear things like the James Webb telescope, right? And it's up there and it's peering off hundreds of millions, billions, trillions of years, light years away, seeing light of stars. You're going, okay, how does that mesh with the Bible? Doesn't that threaten your faith? And I would say no, for two reasons. One, if the scientists are right and everything is that old, okay. Because God's word never tells us the when. It tells us the who. If in fact, 
creation is young and they're seeing these things and does that threaten the idea of a young creation? No. I mean, why couldn't God, the one who superseded all of this, was there at the beginning, why couldn't he have created it old? I mean, he had, did you ever think about how old was Adam when God created him? He had to be a certain age already. He had to be a certain maturity to care for everything and you know, manage the garden. And why, why couldn't God have just created it 300 million years old? That doesn't phase me. And the reality is that God's word, while we can glean some insights about our world and about science and all that, it was never intended as a scientific textbook. It was never intended as a history of the entire world, simply a family history that God is there in the beginning, we're his people, and we can trust him. Do you see? Uh, Similarly, Revelation is not intended to give us all the specific details of the future. You know, uh, you look at things happening today and you wonder, okay, is that that? Is that this? Is he that person? People have been speculating about that for hundreds of years. And, And Revelation is never intended to give us the when all these things happen, but to tell us the who is in control and in charge through all of it. That's why, I don't know about your Bible, but uh, in mine, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because it's about him. It's about him. And so uh, prophecy definitely predicts things that are gonna happen, but it's not given to us so that we would speculate and think about all the different details and how's it gonna happen. It's so that when it happens, we'd be ready and we'd recognize it and we'd go, yeah, and guess who is in control? The same one who was there at the beginning is gonna be there at the end and he's in control of all of it. So Genesis and Revelation are about the who, which begs the question then when we talk about this, uh, how big is your God? Keep that question in mind this morning. How big is your God? Is he big enough to have been there at the beginning and to have simply spoken everything into existence? Do you believe that? If so, is he big enough to to handle all the stresses you've got this week and this month and this year? If he's big enough to speak it all and to sustain it all, surely he's big enough for those things, right? It, It really begs that question for us as we study his greatness and turn our eyes upon him how, how small some of uh, our things become, kind of like the old hymn. You know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. How big is your God? That's the question of the day. See, because in the beginning, God created, how much? Everything. Everything. He created it all. Our God was there at the beginning, at the start, before any of it. In his power, he created everything. Uh, That's what uh, Moses writes here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he tells us in verse two, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. When he says that in verse two, uh, I think it's helpful for us even to point out again uh, that God is in control. See, when Moses is writing this, some of the the imagery that was used in the understanding of the world of people in his day, in the ancient Near East, uh, things like uh, being without form, void, darkness, the face of the deep, all of those were equated with, with, uh, with chaos, potentially with false gods, with evil, with fear. And and Moses says, in the beginning, God created everything. And then he says these things. And and if you're reading this in that day and age, you're thinking, oh, that sounds kind of frightening. I don't like any of those things. But the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The waters, the deep, being another place of chaos and fear. God was in control, he was big, he was supreme, and is supreme over all of it. I mean, what's, what's the thing in your life right now that feels without form and void? What, what's the darkness? What is the face of the deep staring you down? God is sovereign over it. And he's in control 
over it. And when he uh, created everything, he created everything, by the way, in his power, ex nihilo. All right, moving on. You know what that means? I'll give you a definition. Ex nihilo means out of nothing. It's just a Latin phrase. Uh, It means out of nothing. In other words, there was nothing, and then God spoke, and there was everything. I wonder, do you have that kind of power? I don't either. Like, I mean, I, I run things over and over in my head sometimes, different situations, and I wish I had that power to just change things by my thoughts or by saying something, but it never seems to happen. Like, the closest I get is a cold day when I, when I can see my breath and I speak that into existence. But that just fades away. But God, uh, out of nothing, created everything. You're like, how does that work? I don't know. I can't comprehend it. And he had a pattern in how he created everything. He spoke, and then it happened, and then he called it good. That was how God created everything. And he he really, um, he he followed, did this in six days, uh, the first three and the second three kind of parallel and bookend each each other as well. And I would commend to you that uh, God's creation is kind of like the way Bob Ross paints. You didn't see that one coming today, did you? Bob Ross. Do you ever watch this guy? I can remember when I was a kid, you know, he'd be on PBS, and uh, I think my mom probably turned him on, so maybe my brothers and I would quit fighting and just watch him paint, and it'd bring a little calm to the house for a while. Uh, but uh, let me show you how he paints, and I've sped it up for you. But he, he takes off, starts painting, and the first thing is he does is he, he fills the canvas with color. He doesn't really create anything of any a definition or substance. He's just painting color on the canvas. Um, He's just kind of forming the world that he's going to fill. And really, that's how God creates everything. In Genesis, on day one, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and he called the darkness night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then God said, uh, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water and let separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated those that were under the expanse from the waters above the expanse. Um, again, not a scientific textbook, the understanding in that day and age in the ancient Near East was that uh, they were in this like domed area and there were waters above and there were waters below and God put an expanse, the sky in between and he created. Now, not to, not to say that we can't maybe potentially draw some scientific fact out of that, but that's not the original intent. Then day three, by the way, uh, there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then God said, let there be waters under the heavens gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. He called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then that same day, he added uh, vegetation to the land. Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which their seed according, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning on the third day. And then when we get to day four, it's like uh, God circles back and starts painting on top of what he's already painted. A lot like Bob Ross, after he's laid down all the color, starts adding detail on top of what He's already painted. And so on day four, we see not just light and darkness, but we see the agents of light and darkness and the sun and the moon and the stars. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And then uh, he turns his attention to the sky and to the sea. Uh, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, 
every living creature that moves with, the, with, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And then the sixth day, God said, let, there bring forth, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts on the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And he fills the earth with animals. And then at the end of day six, God adds the crown jewel to his creation. He said in verse 26, let us make man, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And then at the end of his work, what God does uh, in creating us, he does something similar to what Bob Ross did, he'd usually grab the red paint and sign his name down in the corner. And when God creates humanity, it's his signature on all of creation. It's his crown jewel. We're the only thing created bearing his image and in his likeness, like him to some degree with emotion and free will and intellect and all of those things combined and and spirituality and we're his signature on creation, the crown jewel of it all, that that signs it and says, this is God's. He did this. The one who was there in the beginning, this is his. And in making Adam and Eve and us the crown jewel of his creation, uh, see, God created everything with big plans for Adam and Eve, with big plans for them. God creates them, he tells them to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. He gives them a mandate. He tells them what they're supposed to do. He says, they're created in my image and then he gives them activity to live out. He gives them an identity and then he gives them activity. I read this already, but let's just look at it again. God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. And then all the things that they're to do, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, Any of you like to fish? That's creation stuff right there. You're imaging God. How about uh, to hunt? Maybe the birds of the air have dominion over all the livestock and over not only that, but all the earth. Maybe you just like to create. You're a builder. You're in construction. Maybe uh, you are a nurse or in the medical field. And like God brings life, you're bringing life and health to people. And, and all of it, whatever it is that we do, and when we do work, God created us for work, we're, we're doing it in a way uh, that honors him and glorifies him and images him. Do you see? Because God had big plans for Adam and Eve, and those big plans were for human flourishing, for the whole earth to be filled. Uh, see, uh, let's keep reading. God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it. I mean, Adam and Eve in their mind probably could have never imagined some of the things that would come to fruition in reality in our day and age, could they? And part of that comes from doing what? Well, having dominion over the earth, subduing it, mining uh, natural resources and uh, researching technology and all, all these sorts of things, right? Subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, he says again, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit, and you shall have them all for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so now here's where the creation order, you know, God speaks, it happens, he calls it good, takes on some significance where we can see humanity as his crown jewel because when God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was now, after Adam and Eve are on the scene, very good, very good. Like the artist who signs their name and steps back and goes, yeah, I got my name on that, that's mine. It was very good. 
And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Now, I mentioned this already, but God created us, friends, in his image. That's what makes us so unique. That's why every human being from conception in the womb to uh, knocking on the door of the grave has value, dignity, and worth. No matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter the color of your skin, no matter uh, your intellect, no matter uh, uh, what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter the language you speak, no matter the languages you don't speak, you matter to God because you bear his image. Not because of anything you've done, not because of any activity in your life, but because of your identity as an image bearer. It's stamped on to you. That's why you value, or that's why you're valuable and why you have dignity and worth before God. Not because of anything you do, but because of who you are. And so God gives Adam and Eve this identity, making them in his likeness, and then he gives them an activity to go live out and to live the way that he called them to live. And and you could kind of sum up living in God's image, bearing God's image, in in kind of three ways. Number one, in, in bearing God's image, we reflect him. Our life is like a mirror. We reflect some of God's attributes with some of the same capacities that he has of planning and thinking and emotion and all of those things. We reflect him just like a mirror reflects light. And we're to live our lives as a reflection of him, pointing our lives at him. Second, we represent him. We represent his ways, his moral laws. We're not the determiners of right and wrong. God is. And we're sent as his representatives to represent his goodness, his morality, his word to people. And then we're to rule like him, his vice regents acting on his behalf in this world, having dominion over it, bringing justice where justice needs to be brought, loving people. All of that is imaging God. And again, I mentioned God has an end game, big plans that he has in mind for Adam and Eve. And ultimately you could sum it up in human flourishing. His desire is for the whole earth to be filled, for him to be there in the midst of it among his people. And it starts off pretty good in Genesis 1 and 2, but then by only chapter 3, everything gets messed up. And we're going to talk more about this in the weeks to come. But in Genesis chapter 3, if you remember what we read here, was that God gave every green plant for food to people and to every beast of the field, and, and they could eat of any of it. In Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 2 kind of circles back and looks at creation again in a more specific way on certain aspects of it. And one of the things we learned there is that God said, you can eat of any tree, but not one tree. There's one in the midst of the garden you must not eat from, because if you eat from it, you will surely die. It was the one restrictive command God gave. Sometimes we think of all of God's commands as he's just got his thumb on everything and he doesn't want us to have any fun. He gave them one restrictive command. Every other command was uh, one of, of activity and of fruitfulness and of goodness. And that one was not to eat from this tree, but of course, Adam and Eve, what do they do? They eat from the tree. She takes the fruit, she's deceived by the serpent, she hands it to Adam and he is as well and he eats of it, they both do and suddenly God's plan for human flourishing is, is there's, it's just thrown on its head, isn't it? And everything gets messed up. But the good news is, and what we'll see, is that that's just in the middle of the story, that's not the other bookend. The other bookend is that uh, while God did have big plans for Adam and Eve and for us, and while we did mess it up in our sin, is that he'll fulfill his big plans in the end. He'll fulfill it. He'll fulfill his original intention. See, the end of Revelation is basically the fulfillment of all of God's initial plans and desires and intentions from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. What God intended, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You get to Revelation 21, 22, and what happens? The earth is filled. Uh, there's so many parallels. There, there's, there's a handful. I mean, you have God in the midst of the garden. In Revelation, you have God in the midst of the city. You go from a garden 
to a city. You have a wedding, a quiet, peaceful wedding with God and two people in the garden. In Revelation, you've got a huge, huge wedding with all kinds of people in a very modern, immaculate city. And you have all these things where it gets drawn out and God brings his original intent to fruition. <clears throat> Which reminds me that whatever's going on in my life, even when I think maybe I've screwed it up too bad finally for the last time, he's a whole lot bigger than that, isn't he? And just like he can work all of creation back to his original intent, surely he's a God of second chances who can work my own failures and my own shortcomings for good in my own life. And he can and he does do that for you as well as you trust him and, and follow his ways. See, uh, what he fulfills in the end, we read about in Revelation. So just before we wrap up this morning, let's turn there together. Revelation chapter 21. And we read this, uh, John is writing and uh, he has a vision of what's to come. And uh, throughout all of Revelation, the main character is Jesus. And now John, verse, chapter 21, verse one, it says, he writes this, he goes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Does that sound familiar? How did everything begin? That first book end. In the beginning, God created what? The heavens and the earth. Genesis, or Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God is recreating everything his recreation. Uh, for the earth, the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. Now again, I, I don't know that there's no sea in the end, no ocean. I don't know that that's maybe what John is saying here as much <clears throat> as he's saying. Remember uh, from Genesis 1, 2, the sea, the deep, uh, all of that was uh, equated with chaos, with, with, with sin, with evil in people's minds. And so to say the sea is no more, evil is no more, chaos is no more. God is in full and complete control and everything is as it should be and as it was originally intended. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That one on the throne is Jesus. No, notice the who here, not all the when. He, he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. All these former things, everything that, that we uh, caused to happen in our sin, all of these things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne, he said, behold, pay attention, look, I'm making all things new. He's recreating it all. Now, some of you, as you've gotten older, more mature, I should say, maybe you've developed some aches and pains in your body. One day you'll have a new body. I wonder, how old will we be in heaven? I'm rooting for about 23 to me, that'd be about, that'd be right on. About 23 years old, that'd be great. But, but in any case, God's gonna make all things new. He's gonna recreate all things to, to his original intent, to goodness. And not only that, but he's gonna be among us in our midst. He said to me, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. To the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. He'll be with us. And everything will flourish the way it's intended to flourish. The reason we feel frustration in life and get irritated with things when they're not the way they ought to be is because God's planted that in us. It's his intent for us, for us to flourish and to enjoy his presence. So friends, as we uh, wrap up this morning and kind of launch into this series, again, I just throw out that question. How big is your God? Is he big enough to be in charge of everything at the beginning, 
as well as at the end, and therefore clearly in control of everything in the middle, including all the areas of your own life to bring order and meaning to your own chaos at times. I'm gonna pray, we're gonna sing, and uh, as we sing, I just want you to keep that thought in mind of how big is your God? Let me pray.